and, and students when they come to know that their articles have got garnered so much news uh, or so much limelight, they are very, very happy and they tend to use it in their CVs, a very good relationship building exercise. I can go on with the stories, but um, but some other time. And I've presented all those stories at Altmetric Conference uh, in 2017 and at uh, ACRL Conference in 2017. All that is available online, the survey results and whatnot. So you have all this, uh, again, I won't go. Uh, autism, big area, um, and there was a chair in Autism Spectrum Disorders uh, appointed, um, Jonathan Wees. Uh, you have disease modeling. Then you also have, um, this was, he was a grad student uh, at UFT and under prof who is at York, uh, Brubaker uh, with the Center of Vision Research. They went on to start a structure of biotech company and into millions in making um, cryoscopy, electron microscopy. So again, very interesting stories, how it has helped uh, students, how it has helped assistant profs and how it has helped in entrepreneurship. So something to know about. Again, I won't go into details, but these has been there, right there for a long, long time. Any topic, if I just see right now, I know the profs, I know who the students are. So fantastic relation building. I was looking at, as I told you, altmetric count and Google Scholar count to see whether there was any correlation. I was doing some Spearman's rank order correlation, won't go into details. But as you can see, as they get, get older, you can see that there is a better correlation. And after a certain time, it stops because Google Scholar citations keep on increasing, whereas altmetric count, it goes up to a certain level and then it doesn't increase that much. Um, even if it is either 25 or 6,000, it will go to certain area, slight this. So you can see that number sort of tell us the story. Um, I won't go into the details of this, but just one story is that the prof here said that I was trying to publish in a high impact journal. At that time, I was a new prof, uh, didn't get, uh, I was told that this is made up data and I published in some other journal. It had a fantastic news uh, coverage and now uh, anybody and everybody wants my work. So stories and lots of stories there. So again, um, so that's why I've shown this slide. Now, um, this is a person uh, I was telling about. They've started this big pharma company, the student uh, who did his PhD and the prof, uh, uh, one of the profs at uh, the Center for Vision Research, again, an organized research unit. So amazing work. Uh, and somehow I'm correlating this to, to all the stories. And, and students themselves, have, uh, he himself mentioned in an interview that the news coverage was something that helped us to build that uh, initial mass and that company. Uh, again, as I said, uh, Rebecca Pillai Riddle, the AVP research, her lab, her papers, uh, autism disorders, I covered uh, chair of autism disorders, where vision research and uh, another ORU, amazing number of papers. This is just three papers, but the list is endless. So, so we have that. Uh, somehow um, faculty members need to know about this. So that has been my my way of uh, telling them and uh, sending and doing some surveys. But coming to how does it relate to academic librarians? Just by looking at the journals now, you can see that which are the important journals. And of course, you have Nature's and Nature and Science and PNAS and PLOS, which are taken up very high um, in news coverage and all that. So this is the, the ones which are very high uh, altmetric scores. So it gives you an idea which are the important journals. Um, they have tie-ups uh, with uh, with the altmetric company. I don't know, but when I've done the research, many of them are Nature Publishing Group and Holzbrick Publishing. I won't go into the details, but but there is some sort of uh, uh, tie-up there uh, or or a preference. I don't know. I may be totally wrong, but I this is what I gathered. Uh, apart from that, it tells me that uh, which which are the areas, upcoming areas of uh, obesity, appetite, new props, all that. Um, last two slides is that how, how has it helped me? It has helped me be very confident in my work. I can just uh, rattle off the research areas, the profs, the students who are coming there to my office when they are doing the systematic reviews. There's a very good connection. They, they know that I speak the language. Now, the other thing is how do you um, uh, use this uh, in showcasing your university? How do you attract new, new talent? And I believe that they have a very important role to play. And we'll see uh, there is um, an article in Wi-Fi where the universities are again asking on the 13th of May, please come together. Tell us how we can sustain research, how we can build research most more, more so in this post-pandemic time. 
So I believe that we need to really bring this to the forefront, show our research strengths and attract new talent. Um, finally, I was looking up all these research from different universities, from UFT, uh, Calgary, McGill, and I was looking up all these that, okay, brain, you've got uh, bees uh, from, uh, from the University of UBC, uh, COVID-19 everywhere now. And I'm thinking that there is so much of uh, similar research going on. And do we know how, where is the meeting point? Do, do universities know? Is there a way of collaboration? And uh, which brings me to my final uh, slide, where, is, where uh, there is this futurity, the blue sky thinking, where, which is from the US. And I see McGill and UFT over there. And basically, they give their new stories to futurity. And you can click on that university, and it will tell you, now this is from McGill, the stories research stories from McGill, from UFT. So I'm thinking, is there a Canadian portal required in this uh, going forward, which will bring all this research together, maybe help researchers, uh, and does Altmetrics have a role to play in that? So again, I've tried to take my presentation in many places, and hopefully it gives you an idea of what is possible with Altmetrics. Thank you very much for your time. Um, any questions? Oh, that's fantastic, Rajiv. That's that's so. That's a great uh, quick overview of altmetrics. I I love. Um, it, it's interesting that you point out the the correlation between you know the the prevalence of altmetric stories and these big journals, you know, Nature and Science and all that. Um, it is interesting that it's always the you know big splashy reports in, in Nature and Science and not sure. some obscure journal. Very interesting there, you know. <laughs> And yes, futurity. So you say that that's American, and and it would be, it would be great if there was a Canadian. Yeah. yeah so, so, but there are two Canadian universities over there. Yeah. 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 Perhaps the Canadian version will, we could call it frigidity. Um, <laughs> so cool. <laughs> that's fantastic. So uh, we don't really have any questions, and uh, we've kind of run out of time. But uh, thank you so much, Rajiv. It's a, a great example of, of leveraging. Altmetrics as a both as a communications device for the university and but but also internally within libraries so that you know more about what's happening yeah. around campus and it, that's that's great I've I, I'll try and do that myself thank you thank you thank you so much uh, next last but not least sit tight everyone next we have Mike <laughs> Taylor. Mike Taylor talking to us. Uh, it's late in the day. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mike, for joining us from uh, from the UK. Um, you are our last speaker, but uh, not the least. Yeah, and no, no, it's a it's a it's a real honor. Um, Jeffrey, how how mm -hmm. do I go about how about, how do I go about sharing my screen? Sorry, uh, um, right now for some reason I'm not able to bump uh, Michael up as a panelist. Uh, Michael, so... have you joined it fully from the browser or from the app itself for WebEx? Oh, from the browser, from the browser. Okay, um, I might need you to join from the app itself. Okay, in which case I will need to boot up my other computer because uh, that is a Linux device which does not have does not have a client. Okay, correct. And I'll chit chat in the meantime. Uh, Mike Taylor uh, is uh, not uh, is a veteran of past Brick conferences. He was with us at uh, Brick. I'm a veteran at everything, Jeffrey. Yeah, <laughs> in Quebec City. Um, uh, Mike is uh, the head of metrics development for digital science. Um, he is based in your in the UK, but specifically you're in. I'm in Oxford. In, Oxford, in I, yeah, UK. I thought so. Um, um, yeah, so and it's a, a really exciting place to live at the moment because I just had a haircut. Um, given that you know we've, we've we've got the vaccine out now, more or less, and uh, doing doing pretty well in that. It's a first first metric of success in these. Covid driven years, I think. Yes. Okay, so I am just going to see if I can. Find and here it. we are. we just saw a talk uh, two minutes ago from uh, from Rajiv Narayani about alt metrics. Apparently, Mike is studying for a PhD in alternative metrics. So Mike is, is trying to. Mike is trying to. Yeah. <laughs> there's um, a tie in between the two. There's, there's, yeah, there's it's a segue. A, yeah. That there, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm sorry, I still not have found the uh, webinar link. In my email. Um, I've already done two webinars today, so. Oh my god. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, it's uh, somewhat of a uh, a busy day for me. Why isn't it coming up? Google is letting me down. Gmail is letting me down. Really poorly letting me down. Uh, and so Mike's talk today is called 
uh, growth of the data driven enterprise and the importance of stories. And, and I think that that's something we should underline here, just as uh, Rajiv a minute ago was talking about telling stories with altmetrics, really bibliometrics, as I keep on banging, hammering away at my colleagues, um, is that you know, bibliometrics is not about numbers. It's not about age indexes or GIFs. It's about the stories you Jeffrey, can tell. I, I think that I might have to share my screen with you and ask you to- Great. Um, ask you to link, because um, otherwise I'm gonna be here all night. Google is being unpleasant. My email is at, at the ready. Just okay, excellent, excellent. Um, do you want to read that out to me? Yeah. Um, so uh, Big Mass, it's a, a D E M like mother. This is sorry, everything is just playing. I must have it in here. Uh, D E. Yeah, I have got it. A-I-N-J at Beckmaster.ca. Google is really, really... Not what do they know about computers, huh? Those Google people. Yeah, right? Swear. Can't trust them with anything computery. Yeah, no, it's shocking. And of course, it's a Google slide, so they can probably hear what I'm saying. Um, okay, so... Well, it's a PDF for... Um, no, phone? it's a it's a Google slide. All right, I'll see if that... Hopefully that's going to go at you now. I it's, it's whizzing across the I'm Atlantic. So, I'm sorry about this, people. This is this is a poor form, poor form from the from the <laughs> British presenter. We'll, we'll blame the goose. It's always the, the gooses that mess things up. I heard that um, Chinese penguin is business goose. I don't know if this is true or not, but I, I hope it's true. Really, the, the Chinese were, it, it, they do look like they're all formal, aren't they? The formal birds. They do, absolutely, absolutely. Any sign of that showing up yet? Um, inbox, other, not yet. Oh, one sec. Um, hitting like, a refresh okay. button there. Yeah, um, there you go. That that's the third. Junk email? No, that's... no, no, no. Then that mailbox. It'll turn up. It will turn up. It'll turn it up. Will definitely turn up. Well, turn every, up. everyone, go, go grab another uh, another cup of tea and come back in, <laughs> in two minutes. No, two, two minutes. Let's, let's definitely say two minutes. That's it. Um, I must. There's another. There's another solution to this. Ah, here it is. I see. You've something got it. Right You've here. got yeah, it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, Not enough in. time. Here goes, there's 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 so, open it in. I I oh. am sadly going to have to. Um, so yeah. Another potential is send it. Uh -huh. A verification code that. Uh, Are you getting Google yeah. verification code? Apparently, I need a verification code. Now. Oh, for heaven's sake! Tell Google um, that I am who I am. That's okay. I got it. I got it. It opens up. Wow! Magical wow. presto. You are more laid back than I am, my friend. <laughs> well, it's been such a great conference, you know. I, I think. Yeah. It's, uh, really I was really sorry not to. I was really, really sorry not to be there. Um, it would have been a good thing to do, um, especially since we have no, no dear colleagues. We've had our retreat this week. We've had the digital science retreat this week, so we've been very busy with uh, internal Don't. internal presentations. And I will share my screen. Mm. Uh, which is that one Firefox there? So I was going to do a number of demonstrations. I'm, I'm not going to do that now because I don't have that software on any other machine anyway. So that's unfortunate. I believe um, people can see your slides me. now. There, there we go. Excellent. OK, so let's start talking, shall we? So um, let's click on there, Jeffrey, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what we're going on to. Um, I'll just say next. Oh. Random, uh, random okay. stages, and we'll see what, we're gonna, see what we get. Oh, I'm trying to go next here. Oh, uh, aha, there we are. There we go. There's me. There's me. Um, that was me in Liverpool two years ago um, when we were still allowed to meet people. So actually, my job title is now Head of Data Insights at Digital Science rather than Metrics Development. I still do that, um, but I, I'm doing a sort of a more broader role. So about this time last year, some of my colleagues came to me um, virtually, of course, and they said, Mike, 
we've got all these people coming to us. We've got all these businesses coming to us and we could use a little bit of extra capacity. And not only do we need extra capacity, we need something other than data scientists. We've got lots of data scientists, lots of people writing code and doing all sorts of really interesting visualizations, but they needed someone who can spin a story, who can talk to people, who has got that sort of softer skill set, if you like, than your, than your typical data scientist. And, and apparently I'm quite chatty. So um, I, I, I was a bit of a shoe in. The, the intention was for it to be um, a temporary thing. I, I'm not sure how temporary it is now. So I'm 50% of the time working with corporates, mostly on dimensions, and 50% of, that's perfect, Jeffrey, sorry. Um, absolutely, you can go on to that next slide. I'll just say next. Um, and 50% of the time working with academics, on, uh, mostly on, uh, mostly on uh, altmetric. Um, I've been around quite a long time. I, I've been at Digital Science five years. Before that, I was at Elsevier for 20 years, which I can barely believe even now. And I've spent a lot of that time working, if not being an academic, working in academia or working with academics. Um, I do a lot of translational stuff. So, um, for example, um, one of the things that I find really difficult to do is when very clever scientometricians and bibliometricians have these very complicated algorithms to, to describe what they'd like to do with metrics. Actually doing that on a, on, a, on a static data set is relatively straightforward. Doing it on something at the scale of dimensions or Scopus, where, which is changing all the time, which has got to be an industrial pipeline, which has got to be absolutely robust, um, absolutely reliable, can never break, is much more complicated and so doing that kind of translation communicating what academics want to technical people who are going to do that going to conferences to talk about it all of these things involve um what in britain we might call the gift of the gap but also that ability to listen to people and listen listen to what different people want to get out of the numbers and translate that into something that other people can do if, if we hit the next not unsurprisingly Click, please. There we go. Non surprisingly, there's a lot of data. Uh, there's a lot of talking about data. And that is why my job has been evolving over the last few years since I started digital science. So, my plan with my talk um, is to talk a little bit about the past and why we've got to where we are, where we're going to. And then I'm going to use a, a, a reasonably fictionalized example that I hope isn't going to get me into trouble of a client to give you some kind of insight into the work that I do as somebody who also still works with academics in academia uh, on bibliometrics and scientometrics, but is increasingly working with what I call the data driven enterprise to use that same data in the pursuit of their work. So let next. So when I say what we started doing, what I mean is the community. So librarians, the scientometricians, bibliometricians, and my career goes back far enough to, to remember the days when all we had was sales data and we were producing, you know, producing paper, uh, paper journals and paper books. And then next, we start producing numbers because we've got servers. And all of a sudden, this world of trying to understand what's going on with electronic products, you know, this is back in the 90s, starts to emerge. We can click. So, and again, we can click. So these numbers start coming in. And to start with, it, it's like magic because we've got numbers to, to play around with. But what we needed was research to really understand what those numbers were, were, were doing. And at that stage, the, we, the researchers, the people who are working with the data can start saying things like, well, you asked for these numbers. We're not just giving you a, a spreadsheet. We're not just giving you a text file with a load of numbers in it. These are numbers that mean something. And then, of course, metrics become formalized over the course of the 2000s. And now we start having these conversations with a broader community because people aren't interested in creating their own metrics, rather they're interested in adopting them throughout the academic environment, explaining what they mean, explaining what the weaknesses are. This is a very subjective history. You can click again um, and probably click again. So we've become this, we start academia, oh, I'm back again. <laughs> Sorry about this. Um, so 
we, we're in this place where we start with numbers, then we figure out what those numbers mean, then we figure out how to use these numbers, and then we start just really recently in the last 10 years trying to figure out what these numbers mean. And we can relate that to the academic field on the next slot on the next slide. Because you know what we're looking at here is that same kind of progression of thought that has been happening over the last 50 or 60 years in the fields of bibliometrics. So next. Um, so we start off with Garfield and with other people. We're looking at the journal. We've got card based, slow computations, very much focused on the journal, not really interested in individual researchers or institutions or anything like that. And then in the 1970s, next, we start thinking in finer grains. Com com computer time has got quicker. We've got databases. We can start doing computations. We can start thinking about things like researchers and articles. Then, of course, the 90s, really, when we start going into um, into that time where we're properly migrating online, you know, we're starting seeing early research into download counts, usage figures, the number of web links that exist. So Mike Thewell, my, 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 my uh, PhD supervisor, um, rest him, um, rest, <laughs> I keep giving him a hassle. Um, he, he was doing some really early work into the number of uh, web links that existed out there. And then, of course, just over 10 years ago, Jason Priam et al. comes up with Opmetric. And at each one of these stages, we're changing the focus of research, going from journals to articles, to the use of articles, to the sharing of articles and the position of articles in society. And then on the next level, we start looking at systems. So we're get, getting increasingly theory based. We're thinking about communication, di dissemination, communication as a system rather than just counting citations. And then, of course, a couple of years ago, five, six over years ago, next, we get, what do we get? We get data science. And at this stage, things start getting a bit crazy for, for people who work in this industry, because all of a sudden, we've got as much data as we want, we've got as much computational power as we want, and increasingly, we have people asking us for those insights. Let's go on to the next. So when I when, the, when I was at school in in the late seventies, there were there was a computer lab that I used to like going to, and in a dusty cupboard there were some card punches. I mean this this is uh, this is probably a, a dating me horribly, but like I said, we didn't ever use them. Um, although I note that uh, the the computer language Fortran that we did use used to used to have to put a star in the sixth column, which would represent a comment, um, and that was inherited from those paper cards that we used to. Uh, we used to use. So back in the day, next, back in the day when Garfield was doing his work, when those early bibliometricians were doing their work, unfortunately, there was a great blog post that described this, but it disappeared a few years ago, such as the way of all things. It talked about the process of having to count citations using card readers, using almost sort of electrical mechanical computers to do these computations. It took months to compute those first metrics. Uh, next. Uh, ten years ago, even even ten years ago, when I was when I was working at Elsevier and we were uh, uh, experimenting with some algorithms, some of these academic algorithms that I mentioned earlier, we would have to book time on a high performance computer, set up the algorithms, make sure they were working, hope we hope they were working, get them in a queue, and when it got really quiet and really cheap, we would be able to run those. And normally that was over the weekend or or overnight. And frankly, if they failed, they failed. Um, and that happened more times than I, I, I would want to confess. You set up your data, you think everything's going to work. You book your time on the high, on the HPC, you press the button, and you come back on Monday morning, and the first thing that happened was it failed. So that was just 10 years ago. Um, and the next. So I joined Digital Science five years ago, and we have a different system for doing computations, and it's incredibly fast. I replicated some uh, some of those open algorithms on on metrics. And the same things that were taking a weekend to run were just taking a few seconds, but there was a cost. There was a cost in, in your, your credit card in to do those kind of computations. And that was just two, three years ago when I started digital science. Now things have gone completely crazy because those calculations are effectively instant and free. If you, you can load that same data, um, the, not just the Garfield data, the, 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 the data sets on, on general citations. You can uh, install millions and millions and millions of data lines and 
calculate, do calculations over them faster than you can think. And that opens up this whole new world, this, this, this new way of thinking about, about data and thinking about the insights that power the data. So if we go on to the next slide, um, and just this is just reflecting really on that growth again. So in the 1960s, we've got Garfield, we've got a handful of people doing that research next. Um, then it starts becoming a very specialized area. Um, we see the diversity of academic research and weather metrics. We've got new fields coming in. In 2000s, we start really getting things like the, the metric tide, that sort of broader engagement of faculty who are involved in, in bibliometrics, scientometrics, trying to understand the data. And then really, we've got this very widespread acceptance of data and evidence in many industries. And, and this, this really brings me to the sort of crux of what I wanted to talk about because we've got this great collision of world and it's what I call the, the data-driven enterprise. Now I live in Oxford, I live in North Oxford, um, literally just a kilometer a kilometer away from me, less than a kilometer away from me, um, is a new a new uh, uh, bioscience park that's being, being built. Um, over the other side of Oxford, there's another biotech park. If you go to say the Churchill Hospital in East Oxford, you go onto the campus there, you've got AstraZeneca there, you've got laboratories run by the university, you've got other startups there. What we've got here is on the first next is we've got a real weakening of those boundaries between academic, academia and research. People are working together. They are seeing the opportunity, places like Oxford University, Cambridge University in the UK, and many other universities around the world, of course, are increasingly investing in enterprises that are taking that science and using it. Um, next one, I mean, for example, in Oxford, we have two startups um, on uh, that are developing self-driving cars. And of course, we've got the growth of businesses, which are, are data crunching businesses. That's what Amazon is. Um, Amazon wasn't founded um, to be a, a bookseller. It was founded because of the metadata that was available and the fact that there was a ready supply chain um, of that metadata, if we go on to the next, that, that, that ready availability of cheap and fast computing opens up a world of um, possibilities. We don't have to, it's not expensive anymore. If we want to do data experiments, we can just choose to do those data exper experiments. It's sort of, that data has become a tool that we can just um, just work with. And of course, you know, we've got this increasing number of um, agile new business models, businesses that we really haven't um, really haven't seen in in a wide scale uh, wide wide scale before. Um, for example, you know, I, I talk to some of my friends who work in the in the sort of the biotech sector. They are so excited about what COVID has done. They're so excited about what cheap and fast computing means they're so excited that, that they can work across the world with academics and and scientists around the world without having to have the constraints of them having to be in oxford paying paying the absurd rents and mortgages that that us per, poor saps in oxford have to pay so let's move on so i've spent a year part-time working with data-driven enterprises and i thought it would be interesting to, to show you what I see as being some of the differences between the way that universities, so 25 years I've been working with universities and, and a year I've been working um, with, with enterprises. And I think there are some really interesting differences between the two. So what we're gonna do is we'll go on to the next slide. I'm just gonna explore some of those. So on the left-hand slide of the next five or six slides, we've got things that I feel are more like a university. And on the right-hand side, got things that are more like an enterprise. This is very subjective and there are people on the call who will disagree with me. Please feel free to disagree with me. Like I said, this is a subjective, um, a subjective report. But for those, because we are all people who work in academia, because there is this growth of the data-driven enterprise, there's every possibility that someone like me, you, your, 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 your Slack vibrates or whatever, and it says, can you go and do some work with enterprises? That can happen with any of us. There are all sorts of opportunities here. So I expect you've seen the meme that's going to appear when Jeffrey hits his space bar. Um, there we go. Um, I really, really love this meme. I use it all the time to, uh, to describe what I do. Um, what's more like a university is, when we hit the space, is really that top bar. 
So for me, working with universities is very much in this space where, where we're negotiating the quality of the data, we're delivering data, we're enriching the data in the case of something like dimensions, and we're beginning to add with some of our analytical, analytical tools that idea of knowledge to the data. But you know, we're working hand in hand with the university to, to develop, if you like, the insights and wisdom, but that is necessarily part of what a university does. And the difference between that and an enterprise is that an enterprise in the next, there are no conspiracy theories, that's just a unicorn which I enjoy, but enterprises tend to not ask us for data or information or knowledge, rather they're coming to us and saying, what's going on? They're, they're looking to us for insight, they're looking to us for, for something which approaches wisdom. And again, this is a very probabilistic model, but in general, they're not interested in the data and the information, they are interested in, in, the, in the interpretive layer of it, which again is something which I'm quite unaccustomed to with, with the more university driven, um, driven businesses. So if we go onto the space, go onto the next slide. So here is another differentiation between the two and it relates, all of these relate to each other. On the left hand side, universities are much more interested in a quantitative analysis Whereas businesses don't mind the qualitative and they also, sometimes they actually prefer the qualitative. So if we just hit the space bar a few times, like three times, Jeffrey. Um, so on the left-hand side there, we've got people who work in bibliometrics who are interested in the number and academics who are more interested in the number. Uh, a little bit above that, academia representing faculty, funding decisions, um, deans, dean's offices and so on. A little bit more interested in understanding what's going on in a qualitative sense rather than just pure numbers and then we hit the space bar um we can go a couple of times funders industry researchers i find industry researchers very very interesting people because typically they're also academics they've worked in academia now they're working in industry they've got phds they're the same they're they're essentially the same population but the way that they work and what they're interested in and the speed at which they need to come to conclusions about things is really quite different and really at the top there we've got people who are making financial decisions or decisions in spending money on research who are determining the direction of their of their strategies and really that those people really uninterested in the numbers much more interested in us um, supporting them to make decisions about what they want to do using qualitative argument which brings me on to the next slide that there is this nice distinction between proof and persuasion. Sounds like a Jane Austen novel. Sadly, it's not. Um, academic uh, organizations much more interested in ideas of proof. Now, if we can click on a couple of times. So things like theory and evidence and correlation versus cause, uh, as neatly summarized in the previous presentation, um, really this belongs in a much more academic-like world, whereas really by the time we get into working, doing the same kind of research work with enterprises, we can click on a few more times. Um, we've got storytelling, we've got argument, we've got rhetoric, because we're talking about making cases for the work. We're not talking about proving a theory or establishing a stage of research, but rather we're thinking about making the case for, for future work, for future investment, um, putting, uh, um, putting argument in, in front of people who will be releasing money for enterprise to start work. If we go on. Um, this is probably a deeply controversial slide because the one thing I am not saying is that enterprises don't care about ethics. Um, let's let's give it a few clicks and I'll sort of enlarge a little bit more on this thinking. So, for example, and I have been to many bibliometric conferences over the years, we very, very frequently get um, embedded in conversations about what is impact, what is responsible metrics, really thinking about what we're doing. Um, these are questions that enterprises don't address. And it's not because they don't care about whether the numbers are good numbers is they know what their context is they know what ent what impact is for them they don't need to have those philosophical decisions they expect academic data to be good to be responsible to be to have that transparency 
something like rankings now that that for me is a really interesting thing you know we've seen a presentation about rankings earlier on it's a it's a, it's a continues to be a hot hot subject um a hot topic and every time there's a new ranking system if people start talking about whether it's the right thing or not um again businesses don't really care about that they just want to know the top 10. it they want to get to the answers really quickly they don't want to get embedded in that discussion about whether the, what they were doing is the right thing or not. And the other thing that they do have, that enterprises do have, is this notion of acceptance of science, which I'm hopefully going to be able to talk about in a, in a little bit. But it's not something that we in academia ever really bother thinking about. Um, let's click on to one more. OK, so this is, uh, yeah, you go back, actually. This, 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 uh, um, so this for me is a really interesting point of view we've had conversations about certain notorious journal metrics which we may cut we may define as being legacy journal metrics um, and those break quite a lot of those uh, um, touchstones that are now the the, fo the focus of modern Santa metrics um, and it's probably one of those cases you know it's like the old adage you know well if you want to get to Dublin you don't want to start here um, we probably don't wouldn't Nobody, I suspect, would invent that metric over again. There's no need to invent that metric over again, and it's probably not the right thing to do. Enterprises are completely oblivious to the discussion about whether this is um, about whether this is a good metric or a bad metric or anything else. They just don't care. It's not important to them. So you know, we can click that that thing, and for me, this is quite a quite an idiosyncratic thing that that metric, again, or that those metrics that break so many of those. Um, uh, ideas of what we consider to be responsible metrics belongs with the with the university it is just an interesting an interesting observation for me um so if we can click on so yes another one universities very much more interested in the state of research and where it's got to maybe where it's going on um, being able to demonstrate success, promotion and tenure committees and so forth, strategic positioning. I've done a, I've done a fair amount of this with academic institutions. And enterprises are much more interested in forecasting and that reflective um, stage of investing in research, trying to identify where where there are research gaps. So again, there's a bit of a bit of a flip side, bit of a tension between the way the way that we're we're using the same kind of approaches. But rather than looking at the at the university or the journal or the researcher and saying, what have you done? Um, what's the progress been? Rather, they're, they're using that data to try and identify spaces that they can move into, opportunities to develop businesses, if you like. We move on to another one. Um, so I'm going to give you a very, very anonymized case. Um, unfortunately, it is going to be truncated because, um, as you may have gathered, I've got a whole bunch of visualization software on my machine that doesn't actually run on anything other than a Linux machine. Um, I don't have it on my little uh, my little Windows laptop. So unfortunately, I can't show you that. I'm really, really sorry. Um, I thought that there wasn't going to be an issue with webinar. So anyway, very, very anonymized case. Um, nobody is going to recognize this. I'm not going to get into trouble for it. And it doesn't matter. Right. So let's 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 just take a hypothetical company. The, a name that you may very well recognize. Um, they create, they, they, they manufacture gym equipment, they, they manufacture sports clothes. There is, particularly in the sports clothes area, there is a lot of competition. Margins are being reduced, but nevertheless, they're quite a cash rich business. And if we hit the space, space bar, um, one of the things that, uh, you can go back one probably, um, one of the thing, Oh, that'll loop, that'll loop. So one of the things they've been doing is to uh, spend money on uh, on nutritional supplements, so things like whey powders, um, and they've got kind of a co-branding thing going on there. But they're really, really interested in branching out um, and going further into this area, which is my next, um, which is the area of sports supplements. Now, I'm a bit, I, I do like going to the gym. I go to the gym quite a lot, so I'm quite familiar with uh, some of the conversations that go on in gyms about these things. If you go to the next slide, um, it is if, if if you're not familiar with it, the, it's a huge business. Um, so th this is a snapshot from a company called PipingRock.com, which I think is a pharmacy uh, based in in the EU somewhere, um, and there are enormous numbers of products um, that we are that, that that are available for sale here. 
Um, what's really interesting is that the science, I'm going to characterize, I, I did characterize it as being weak, but it's not really weak. It, it's more thin. Um, it, all of these things look very scientific. If we hit the, if we hit the space bar, Jeffrey, um, glucosamine is a, is, is a fairly good example that I was going to use as my de demonstration. Um, if we click on the next space bar, we can go to a snack, a page from uh, drugs.com, uh, which describes the role of glucosamine, and we hit a uh, space bar. So this definition starts off with, um, a, you know, some factual observations about glucosamine. Um, if we hit the next space bar, then, oh, we've got this really interesting thing, used in alternative medicine, whatever that is. Um, not all uses for glucosamine have been approved by the FDA. Should not be used in place of medication prescribed for you by your doctor. Um, and here we hit the space again. Often sold as a herbal supplement. There are no regulate. This, this for me, this is fascinating. There are no regulated manufacturing standards in place for many herbal compounds, and marketing marketed supplements be found to be blah 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 blah. Right. So you know, we start at the top with a little bit of science, a little bit of fact-based stuff, and then drugs.com. Um, says, oh, by the way, for other people use it for this. Um, and then right at the bottom, um, there's, you know, uh, some pretty stiff warnings. Um, so anyway, turns out glucosamine, um, unfortunately, this will be where I'll be breaking out into, um, I don't think I have another slide, Jeffrey, um, along this topic. Um, yeah, so, oh, there, there are some links there, which is kind of um, really helpful. Jeffrey, I think what I might do tomorrow is to put in some screenshots into this so we can um, have a have a link somewhere. Um, so if you go and have a look at glucosamine research on, on your favorite uh, index, which of course has to be dimensions, um, then you'll find that there's there's quite a lot of research. There's there's 30 odd thousand papers about glucosamine. But as soon as you start adding in things like sport and exercise and recovery, um, you find literally that there are hundreds of papers, just just hundreds of papers, and maybe not even a hundred a year. It's an enormously small area of research. And yet if you go into any gym, um, you will find people who absolutely swear on uh, on various glucosamine supplements and who will buy them from places like Piping Rock, perfectly good um, uh, place, uh, place to buy things like that. Um, what this uh, this organization, this, this hypothetical, uh, as it were, example um, of organization offers is that they they have a really strong presence in that market. So gym equipment and gym clothing and dietary supplements, they understand that they've got places in supermarkets where they can make they can position products. But at the moment, um, I talk about that science, that science is very thin. There's not a strong evidence base. So my client, um, they were coming to us and they were saying, we're interested in this space. Can you do some research on here? What are we looking for? We're looking to see, well, are there other people doing the research in this space? Is there, um, is there good evidence for it? So if I was gonna come at this as, um, as an academic uh, reporting on this, we can hit the space bar. Um, <laughs> yeah, sorry, this was a quote from, uh, from, a, from a friend of mine who said, uh, so, so what do you do when a client comes to you and they say, um, we want you to do some research in this space and you go into dimensions, you do a bit of research and you find there's like 80 articles. And this is where you do get this, this idea that you have to do this kind of odd mix of quantitative and qualitative research. And remember that, um, that the enterprise isn't looking for uh, a, a series of findings of research from the past, but rather looking, looking to the future. If we hit the next space bar, I will be wrapping up super quickly. Um, so, you know, in summary, then um, we can hit the space bar a couple of times. Um, we've got these dimensions that I've created that make a distinction between where the enterprise lives and where the academic lives. There is this space in the middle. There is an interstitial space where they're coming together. And my feeling is that as we see the growth of um, the data driven business, as that is enabled by by uh, computational power um, and acceptance of research, then increasingly we're going to see those two worlds coming much more much more closely. And I suspect that from a career point of view, people who work in this space in academics are going to start seeing more opportunities for working outside of academia, but doing the same kind of work. Um, and if we click on a, on a space bar, um, to go forward, 
Um, you know, so if I was thinking about glucosamine, if I was writing an academic report, you know, really, there's there's so little research that you just say it's very, very weak. Uh, there's no clinical trials. There's very few people working. There's no funding. Um, you know, this is not a great opportunity for, for research. We can hit space a couple of times, Jeffrey. Yeah, no breakthrough discoveries. Uh, it just doesn't look very good. But this isn't what the enterprise is thinking. The enterprise is thinking, do we have an opportunity here to create this product and to stick it on the shelf next to uh, next to our other products? Can we use our brand name to, to leverage activity in this? So the sort of things that they're really interested in are, well, who are the research teams? Which PIs have got an interest in this space? Very often, there's no funding available in these spaces. Um, is that something that the enterprise can get involved with? They're also asking, for example, are people working in, uh, in, in, in places that have a clinical, clinical foundation? Do they have experience in work running clinical trials? All of these things are absolutely essential steps in terms of generating um, the data, the evidence to start building uh, building products in this space. Now, I really, really, really wanted to talk about the acceptance of science in the last like minute or two minutes I've got left to speak. Um, acceptance of science just not something we really talk about. It is really important in terms of um, in terms of the vaccine movement and the anti-vaccine movement, because that really is this notion of what is um, acceptance of science. In other words, to what extent? Do people buy into the science? Do they believe the science? Do they trust the science? Because this is a really important part of that communication. If my hypothetical organization is going to invest in a glucosamine supplement, they really want to know that broadly that population of people who go to gyms who are going to be consuming that product accept the, the notion that glucosamine is a useful supplement to for restoring um, joint mobility after a heavy weight session, for example. So if we hit the space bar, um, um, we can hit it again. So, you know, when we think about acceptance of science, you know, what are we thinking about? We're thinking about which are the leading academics? Is there is there a large audience for this kind of research? Really interestingly, um, just just sort of personal reflection of mine, I, I, I made a very serendipitous discovery um, when I was uh, investigating the acceptance of science of um, this uh, glucosamine inspired research. Um, so there's a wealth of data that uh, exists across dimensions, across the altmetric, and of course all these other platforms which enterprises can use to to really use our scientific the, the scientific knowledge that we, we're generating inside the academia to develop new businesses, um, which are data data driven. And my final slide, I hope, is my final slide because I'm very mindful of the time. Why does this matter? Um, well, okay, this isn't my final slide, penultimate slide, the spacebar again. Um, if you know, my, my, my hypothesis is that academia and enterprises are coming together, we're powered by the same data, powered by um, the same computational power. Um, increasingly, people like ourselves who have spent our entire working careers working with academics and working with academia are going to be having conversations with, uh, with enterprises, maybe getting jobs there, maybe forming partnerships, enterprise partnerships, maybe forming spin-offs. Conversations are kind of different. And people who run businesses have different ways of looking at the data and looking for insights. And for me, my big takeaway from this is that you have to kind of, you have to do get out of your comfort zone um, when you want to start working with with the, with data driven enterprise. Um, I do have a final slide. Uh, we just bang right through the there we go. Very 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 subjective summary. Um, you are in the hot seat. Working with businesses, working with enterprise gets very real, very fast. You do not have the time to sort of set up your research project. You don't have a year. You maybe have a week, you maybe have a day to get interest in to, 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 to work on a project. It is uh, the same kind of research that we do, but at a very, very fast, focused, targeted layer. They're much more interested in the here and now and what's going to happen in the future. Having um, understanding that science is extremely important, but also understanding where it sits to society is really important for, for the enterprise. And I'm going to stop there. And thank you for bearing with me. Well, that's brilliant. Thanks so much, Mike. That's a great uh, insight in, into the, the fast paced, you know, changing world of, of practical science, how, how, you know, uh, how businesses are using insights and using bibliometrics to, uh, to make decisions. Yeah. So, it is really interesting. I mean, I, I, I've had a number of conversations with my academic colleagues where they say, are people doing that? Who's doing that? 
Um, and I sort of give them these my hypothetical examples, and they go, well, of course they are. I had never thought about that. Why wouldn't they be doing it? But the, the, the interesting thing is that they weren't. A few years ago, they were you know, maybe paying an academic to write a report, but they weren't doing this work themselves. Um, and that, that, that's really where, you know, where we're, where, where we're coming to. It's, um, uh, it's a, a definite step and it's a definite new role, I think, for people like us, um, people who work inside, um, inside a big metrics. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got a question here. Um, what do you think of emerging so-called, <clears throat> in quote, smart citations um, by a company, for example, called uh, cite.ai um, that ex include citation statements extracted from the full text of the citing article it, and then it categorize is, those yeah. as supporting or mentioning or disputing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it's, I, I think it's an idea that's kind of, that, that for whom the time has come. Um, it has been around for a, for a very long time. So um, I, I go back to, so my kids are in the sort of at university now, which tells you how old they are because they're not geniuses. Um, but when they were very young, I went to Grenoble to work with some people over there and they were doing exactly that. So this is 15 years ago. Um, and they were doing a, doing a semi-guided extraction um, and then typing, typing it against, um, against a, a very small taxonomy it was a 400 sorry it was a four item taxonomy so it was either something like agreeing uh, disagreeing supporting or factual so it was a really basic thing but even then i thought this is this is really clever um i'm not sure that it necessarily helps us understand citation count because uh, you know, as as Gilbert, um, you know, back in the sixties, identified citation practice, um, at least within the STEM subjects, tends to be either neutral or positive. Um, it's a little bit different in the humanities, where you get more reviews, so you get more negative um, negative citations. So I think it's I think it's kind of interestingly. Um, I'm gonna, I really want to see how this works out. I've seen seen it done so many times. I haven't yet gone oh yeah that makes a lot of sense and that's partly you know because as, as i say we we're taught how to cite and what citation means which is a, a little bit difficult so this is what gilbert was talking about when he was talking about the social construct of science and um and 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 the sort of best practice that we inherit if you like from the people who teach us of what we're doing so generally speaking we don't cite things that are bad um, but, you know, it, 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 it will be very interesting to see how that works. I mean, there are certainly people like Chow Mei Chen at Drexel who, um, who have done some really interesting work on, on that kind of thing. So I, I mean, I don't know if, uh, Chow Mei's ever presented at Brick. He, he should do. He's an amazing speaker, um, and a fantastic visualization of impact. We should probably have a, have a conversation with him about that. Um, but one of the things that Chow Mei does is to look at, uh, discourse drift. So, for example, he will plot the, the strength of assertions. So what he does is he, he takes the citations, he finds the citation, citing root, he extracts the sentence that makes the citation, um, so which is the relevance to, uh, to smart citations. Um, and then he will uh, identify the strength of that assertion. So, for example, um, you know, back in the 80s, an assertion might be something like um, HIV has been has been suggested to be a possible agent uh, in transmission of AIDS, something like that. So a very weak, highly hedged statement, whereas now, of course, you will find the statement HIV causes AIDS, um, and it is a sort of a black and white assertion. And he's done all sorts of really interesting work in the strengths of, of assertions, um, who's making contradictory, how we deal with contradictory assertions. Um, and, I, and I think that really goes to, uh, goes to the point of, uh, of, of smart citations as well there is data there that we can start using the thing is had that little experiment that i was involved with in grenoble had, had worked we there was nothing we could do with it i mean mm -hmm. it might have looked good but but how are you going to use it how are you going well, yeah, to exactly. articulate those findings in, in that makes any sense i suspect that you know we're getting to a situation where we now can do that 
yes, I think when, when this I used to work at, at, a, at a research lab at the NRC at 20 years ago, and they were the very first thing people thought about when they heard about bibliometrics is, well, we, we could do text analysis and extract all the positive yeah. context from all the negative context. Yeah. But um, and when SCI site got AI announced their mm -hmm. their, uh, you know, their, their, their categorization system, it, it sent shivers down my spine. I worried. I mean, amongst bibliometricians, <laughs> that's fine. But you know what's going to happen uh, as soon yeah. as non-specialists get a hold of this, they're going to say, uh oh, so and so has 10 positive citations and they've got five negative citations. So you do 10 minus five equals five. Oh. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just simple numbers, yeah. right? You know, and, yeah. And, yeah. and I pointed out in a, um, as a conversation was happening online, you know, I pointed out that, that people want to discount negative citations, you know, and they use that as a way of dismissing the, the relevance of, of bibliometrics. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I said, no, 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 no. Negative citations are crucial. We need negative citations. That's what, yeah. That's how yeah, science yeah. evolves, right? Yeah. If there were no yeah, negative absolutely. citations, yeah. we just yeah. uh, that job, job what science is done. We can all go home. That's yeah. Yeah. Works. Yep. everything's possible. Yeah, I, I, I remember ages ago sitting next to a guy who was doing some research into a particular, um, he, he did his PhD in a, into a particular um, uh, uh, compound um, that was hoped to do something. I can't remember what it was. And he said at the end of the PhD, they decided that this compound didn't work. And he wrote a paper that just said it doesn't work. And of course, it gets no citations. Um, mm. I mean, he got his PhD. There's no problem about that. But it's that whole. It's it's the end of research. And actually, we should be we we should probably be citing this guy, you know, because he 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 stopped a, a, a useless piece of science, which I think is you know a wonderful contribution. Uh, one last question. Um, it's a sort of a combination of two questions here. Uh, uh, talking not so much about the data, but about yourself. Um, what spurred uh, your transition from academia to the enterprise side of things and so was I, it, I, were you were inspired by the the availability of computational power or were there um other yeah so th this is a really really interesting uh question and if i had an hour i'd talk about it so my dad <laughs> was my dad was a research scientist um but he started as a greenhouse technician and he ended up as uh, one of uh, one of the uk government senior senior scientist scientists scientists he spent quite a lot of time working in on wheat in in Canada actually as well and well in, in Denmark. Um, so he, he was a, a very uh, a very famous scientist in uh, in uh, agricultural weeds, um, despite the fact that he really didn't have any qualifications. Um, he was even sort of supervising part time supervising PhDs. I mean, it's the sort of thing that doesn't really happen nowadays. Mm -hmm. So for me, the laboratory was my background. Um, as it happens, I was a useless student. I, I have um, I have a brain of a butterfly. I if you if you looked around my room, if I had my camera on, you'd see weightlifting equipment, you'd see camera, you'd see my motorbike helmet, um, you would see um, my 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 shirts that I'm having to um, adjust. Um, I I am interested in all sorts of things. I run a theatre company with my wife. I'm that kind of person. Um, I don't have the focus really to work in academia full time, but I get it. I get it on a cultural level. And I would say that I was a scientist or an academic on, on that sort of social, cultural level. I understand what you people, what you guys are doing. Um, I understand it. I value it and I appreciate it. And I also have a great deal of imagination um, for what computers can do. And I've always had that ever since like the very beginning. So for me, um, I, I kind of want to help. I love communication. Publishing for me was where I wanted to go. It was always what I wanted to do. I have a vocation for publishing. Um, and that was what I started off doing. Um, working with academics to to help surface their ideas. So that, that's 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 me in a, in a in a nutshell. Thank you so much, Mike, for for wrapping up for being our, our closing speaker at the end of three days. Really, a real talks. real pleasure. Okay, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next year somewhere. I hope Sydney, so. I hope so. Um, absolutely. And if and if it's in uh, if it's in francophone um, francophone um, Canada, then I will be happy to address the conference in French, I believe. Um, I am currently working, so in on Altmetric, we are indexing uh, some, some non-English language sources. Um, and myself and a colleague are planning on writing a paper in French for uh, one of your French bibliometric journals. Um, my French was terrible, then it was very, very good in my 20s, and then my 30s and 40s, it completely died away. Um, and then I got a part in a play where someone, where I had to speak French and um subsequent to that i've been working extremely hard on it so um 
looking forward to at least speaking um, French, French, as it were. <laughs> yes. Well, we, I, I can teach you lots of uh, funny uh, Quebecois French uh, sayings. That, uh, I'm looking forward very, to that. Very Next colorful. Time. <laughs> <laughs> Next time in Montreal. Yes. Okay, super. Um, so just uh, thank you everyone uh, for joining us. Uh, you'll see the slide of the goose flying away off into the sunset. Um, you can revisit your favorite uh, ponds, land again on your favorite ponds by uh, visiting the Brick YouTube channel. Don't forget to give us your feedback. If you go to the Brick uh, website, there's a feedback form there. Tell us about the talks that you like the best. If you have any suggestions for um, how we could improve this conference, uh, I, I I will admit, I, I understand and that you know, the social interaction virtually is not the same as what it is in person. And, and I apologize for that, but we're, we're doing our best. Um, and uh, give us some suggestions as where as to where we might host um, BRIC 2022, someplace um, exciting and warm, perhaps. So uh, Bella, can, can we uh, fast forward one more slide, please? Yes, and I also have a few people Thanks just again. asking you when the timeline for the talks being posted is on the YouTube channel. Uh, uh, yeah, we, I, I guess we have to just double check uh, what's involved in processing them, uh, but uh, I, I could anticipate fairly, fairly soon. And one more slide, please. Bella, one more forward. There we are. So. <laughs> That's and a good I, I slide. Just, on, um, sorry, Jeff, just on behalf of the group, everyone who's been listening in, I think we should all really thank George for his leadership this year. I think he's played such a, a pivotal role with just making sure this has happened. Um, and so he really has been a fearless leader. So thank you, George. Oh. Well, yeah, and and thanks for to to all three, three four of you. Uh, we couldn't have done it without, uh, especially our 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 Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology hosts, and in particular Lisa and uh, Bella, who's been uh, so excellent in supporting uh, the virtual event. So. Um, attendees are also Thank asking you. if slides will be made available. Yes. Yeah, we're working on uh, obtaining them from the uh, from the presenters. We'll make a call out to them, and we should have them up as soon as we can get them. We'll we'll be able to put them up. I, I've got my slides. Okay. Excellent. Well, I think uh, I think we can officially call it to a close, unless there's any any last uh, thoughts from anyone. Wants to sit around and chat, talk about some geese. So, Everybody give a big smile for a group picture yeah. at the end. Oh, and the goose. There you go. And the, and the goose. The goose gets in the picture too. <laughs> you know, it's Perfect. the University of Waterloo goose there. Okay. All right. Great. Uh, Isabel, I'm wondering if you can maybe put us into uh, panelist yeah. mode uh, or test mode and.